So humanity has always had a desire to predict the future, to understand what's going to happen going into it. And uh, we developed various kinds of methods for doing that. Astrology, tarot cards, you know, all kinds of interesting things. We've also realized that maybe one way to understand how the, what the future is going to be like is to observe nature. So we count the number of red berries, or we look at dead fish, and so on, and we try, based on that, to understand if it's going to be a cold or warm winter, and, and so on. And these are sort of fairly simplistic methods. However, during the last couple of decades, there's actually been a revolution in our ability to predict the future. And some examples, even though we tend to make jokes about it, we are actually much, much better today at predicting the weather, at least a week or two into the future, than we were a few decades ago. Our cars now know in advance when they need to go and have an oil change. We have signs in the subway station telling us when the trains are coming. And we've even been able to start predicting things like political elections, much, much more precisely than we could just a few decades ago. So five, six years ago, we had a weird idea. The reason we are good at making predictions is that we have done two things. First of all, we've been able to develop better sensors for sensing nature or the world around us, you know, whether it's the temperature and the air pressure or if it's the oil particles in a car. And then we had this, and then you can combine that with a mathematical model, which allows you to, to, based on previous experience, predict the future. So two things, sensors and mathematical models. And then we had this weird idea five, six years ago. Maybe we could start using humanity as one gigantic sensor. Everything we write on the web, the blogs, tweets, and so on, is actually a way of sensing what's happening out there in the world. So what we decided to do was to start gathering that information, which is, of course, unstructured text, try to get some structure out of that, and then create mathematical models to be able to predict future happenings. So we started building what we like to call the web intelligence machine, which is a machinery for gathering information about what we do globally, what we think, what we know, what we hope, what we dream, and so on. We do this on a fairly large scale. We don't gather everything on the web, but we do gather something like 300,000 sources, plus significant parts of Twitter and Facebook and so on. We analyze eight languages today, English, Arabic, two kinds of Chinese, Russian, French, Spanish and Farsi. So, of course, we don't cover everything we said there, but fair enough. I'm out. What we do then is that we take all this information. This is hundreds of billions of documents. It's billions of facts or ideas about the world. And we try to group that together to be able to understand what's happening and what might happen in going forward. One key understanding here is that time is important. Of course, when you're talking about the future, you need to realize what time is. But current search engines on the web don't understand time. If you go into Google and, and Google for Norrköping next week, for example, you'll end up finding probably some very popular article containing the words Norrköping next and week, written in 2006 or something, something like that. So it's really useless. Google is useless, for example, for, for knowing what's going to happen even next week. So what we decided we had to do was to do what we like to call temporal analytics, to actually understand what's being written about time. And the intriguing thing is that we've done analysis of this now, and if you look at all the times we mention time on the web, something like 3 to 5% is actually talking about the future. That's all kinds of future. So it's someone tweeting that you need to go and buy milk before lunch, up to making predictions about the weather 100 years into the future. So there's a huge time span, but still 3 to 5% of a large amount of information is about the future. So we developed what we like to call temporal analytics. So it's really a very simple idea. It's one of those ideas when you hear about it, it's so obvious, you wonder why no one did it before. Uh, we still wonder that, actually. So, so the idea is that if I, if I get a, an article published on July 24th, which says three days ago the official website of something was hacked, then, of course, I know that this is something which happened on July 21st. Similarly, if I have something published on July 17, which says that on August 14, we will be doing this and this, then you know that that can be put onto the timeline into the future. So what we're able to do is take all these mentionings about people, places, and, and, and events, and put them out on a calendar timeline. And I'll show you in a little while why we use this information, how we use this information to actually make predictions. The other thing you need to do is to create structure out of the only unstructured text you have out there. We do that in two ways. One is fairly obvious. It's to find what is being talked about, what are the entities talked about, persons, places, organizations, companies, technologies, what, what have you. So we extract those kind of things, and we also find events. Simple example again. 
take an uh, official press release from AP and a tweet, both talking about earthquakes. One says Port-au-Prince, one says Haiti. But we can both analyze that these are natural disaster events of an earthquake type. We also have ontological information in our system which keeps track of, for example, which cities are located in which countries. So we're actually able to tie together these two pieces of information and say that they're actually probably related to the same thing because Port-au-Prince happens to be the capital of Haiti. So in this way, we, we gather information, we structure it, and we manage to link it together. And we can use that to present it. So we can produce timelines. This is a timeline from 2010 up to today about natural disasters in Haiti. You can see that the earthquake in 2010 is the predominant one, but they've had a few typhoons and other things as well. We, of course, present this in other ways as well. So you, since we have geographical information, we can put it out on a map like this. We can show that most of it is talking about Haiti in general, but there are also a few particular places where there is information. So how do you use this to actually make predictions? Can we actually create a crystal ball out of all this unstructured, massive information we find out there on the web? Turns out there are actually various ways to do this, and uh, we, we've been working with a collection of different kinds of methodologies for doing that. And what I'm going to talk about now is actually very recent results. We've been working over the last six months on actually building mathematical models. Remember that to make predictions, you need two things. You need to be able to sense things. That's what we do in extracting structure from the text. And you need to be able to create a mathematical model, which, given what the world looks like today, can say something about how it might look tomorrow. So we decided to try that out on one area which is non-trivial, and that's trying to predict social unrest protests of various kinds. So this is Tahrir Square. If you're going on vacation to Egypt, you might want to be, know if, you, if you'll end up in something like this, and you either might like it or you might want to avoid it. So can we actually predict these kind of things? Turns out we can. In some cases, it's very simple. So if you're lucky, someone is explicitly using the web or Twitter in this case to gather people to an uprising or protest like this. You know, so in this case, there is actually a call for protests on Tuesday. So, of course, if we analyze this, then we can say that, yes, there will be something happening. But that's just one single tweet from an unknown person. And uh, what you really need to do here is to, to gather more substantial evidence. And this is one of the basic principles that even though there might be small pieces of unreliable information, if we start gathering it together, actually crowdsourcing predictions about the future, then we can improve our predictability. So what we like to call algorithmic crowdsourcing is the next way of, pr of predicting things. So here we have a few thousand talks about protests. And actually what I did here, I, I went in and I, and I looked what we had in our system uh, on the next 30 days starting today. And you see there are a couple of planned things here. We can see, for example, there at the end of November, there seems to be a planned major protest somewhere in the world. And if we go in to look at the details, we see that this actually is Friday the 29th in the US, known as Black Friday. That's the day after Thanksgiving when everyone goes out shopping. Uh, and in this case, there are planned protests at Walmart and Target. And, uh, you know, since the guys protesting use the web to organize this, we get very exact information. We've seen examples where they actually, you know, up to the level of saying which side of the parking lot you're supposed to meet at. So, of course, you can use this and, and, and understand what's going to happen. So crowdsourcing information like this is, is the next way of doing it. There are more ways, though. Anniversaries. In many parts of the world, anniversaries are very important. And you can use them as a way of understanding what's going to happen. So what we have here is looking at Egypt, the level of protests. Again, of course, this is not the real world. These are the protests being talked about. But still, on the top, you have 2011. That was the year of the Arabic Spring, as you probably recall. And we can see that the end of January, that was January 25th, was the big revolution day in Egypt. And of course, the next year, 2012, there were protests to celebrate that. And if you look down this year, again, you can see that there was a significant up, upswing in, in protests. And if you're now planning your vacation to Egypt, maybe, maybe you would decide that going to Cairo at the end of January 2014 is not such a good idea, based on observations like this. So anniversaries is another way we can predict what's going to happen. However, you need to be more clever than this. This is one of my favorite quotes by Jerry Seinfeld. You know, it's amazing. The amount of news every day just exactly fits the newspaper. He said that as a joke, but we've actually been able to verify this mathematically. And, and you, if, you, if you look at this, here's extracted from our systems. These are tens of millions of facts about protests in the world globally. 
what we did here was we accumulated everything. We picked out the 14 countries, which has the highest number of reported protests. And we then looked what relative amount of news space did each of these countries cover for every single day, actually done uh, on a seven-day rolling average like this, going from July 2012 up to July this year. And if you know your world history and good at geopolitics, you can actually identify a lot of things here. So what we have here, 9-11 last year, we had protests in Libya, that's when the US ambassador was shot, and so on. A few months later, Israel had an invasion in Gaza. Then there were the riots in India based on the, the rapes of young women on buses. We had the anniversary, as I already mentioned, in Egypt. We had in Bangladesh uh, the factory, the clothes factory, which collapsed and, and had a lot of protests following that. And this year, pretty exciting year for someone wanting to do this kind of analysis, there was first in Turkey the big protest in Taksim Square. And as you can see, they almost filled out all the new space. The, the pages on the newspapers allocated to, to protest, you know, the three pages, which comes before the 20 pages of sport, is full with Taksim stuff. But then, after, say, 10, 15 days, maybe, of course, we get tired of these constant Turkish protests. So instead, the Brazilian protest against the high bus prices took over. Lasted for a couple of days before we were back in Egypt again when there were protests on the anniversary of Morsi coming into power. And so it goes on. So this is, of course looking after the fact at how things were. The question is, again, can we actually predict the future? So let's look in detail at the protests in Libya. This is what the news reports and web reports and, and tweets about protests in Libya looked like for 2012. And you see, of course, that as things erupted on 9 of the, uh, 11th of uh, September, we have a huge peak. But the interesting thing is, of course, was there any signal beforehand which could help us identify that this was about to happen? And indeed, if we look at the weeks before that, you can see green here is general media, blue is Twitter, and red are retweets on Twitter. So what we can see is that there was indeed an interesting pattern in the weeks preceding these events. There was an increase in the number of tweets and retweets. And our hypothesis based on these kinds of observations is that retweets in particular is a good way to see that there is something people care emphatically about. If you, if you care about something, you retweet something, some news about it. So clearly something was ha about to happen here. We looked at Egypt, same way, for 2013. Uh, and here are a couple of slides now where you really need to pay attention to understand what these graphs are showing. So in this graph, the red here is reported protests. So these are reports of things actually happening. The green is predictive news. So the green is the percentage of all reports which are actually talking about the future. So for us, a predictive event is when you publish something today which says that something will happen tomorrow or one month from now. And as you can see, interestingly here, there is a sharp uprise in green predictive things before you see the peaks in red actual protests happening. So again, this is not proof, this is just an indication that there is indeed some signal there which could be used to predict what's going to happen in the future. And we looked at other places, we looked at Lebanon, exactly the same structure. You can see that we, here we only looked at Twitter, but there were before every peak there was peak of actual events, there was a peak of tweets talking about these things probably happening or someone planning to do something. So it's very simple to look at these things after the fact and, and make ideas and say, oh, clearly there's a causality here. But to, to really be able to do this, of course, you need to, to be more methodological. So we decided to go into more detail. Here's another example. We looked at Egypt. Again, a slide you need to think a bit about. So what we have here on the y-axis, we have the publishing date. So that's the day an article is published. On the x-axis, we have the event date. That's the day something is supposed to happen or have happened. And what we're plotting here are all the predictive events. So what we can see here is that in general, and actually let's zoom into details here. In general, what we can see is that the predictions are one or two or maybe three days into the future. So that's when the articles are talking about it. Except, actually, in this case, as you can see, that already on, on the 1st of June, we had predictions about protests taking place on the 30th of June. Because that was the day when there was the Morsi anniversary, and people knew well beforehand that they were going to be out protesting in the streets. Interestingly, as you see, it's, uh, we only have predictions about protests on that specific day, and then it's nice and blue, there's nothing happening afterwards. 
this is pretty much, you know, like in Sweden, everyone knows that there will be demonstrations on the 1st of May, but then everyone expects that everything is norm back to normal on the 2nd of May and we're all happy again. Uh, and looking at this beforehand data, it looks like the same thing would be in Egypt. You know, let's have a day of protest and then get back to work. As you might recall, this was not the case. In Egypt, actually, things continued to be getting worse and worse after the last of June. And if you look at another way, you can look at the same thing. This is the number of references to protests on June 30 by how many days in advance. So you can see up to maybe 30 days in advance, there were essentially a few mentions, but then it took off. And the week before, you could see that there was a sharp, sharp increase in the number of people talking about that this is a day I'm going to be out protesting. Of course, you can't look at only one country. So what we did was we, we gathered data. We took two and a half years of data from our system from 19 different countries. We then used mathematical machine learning model, as it's called, to look at all events from the 1st of January up till uh, March on 2013 to train the system. This is how you make a predictive model. You take historic data and you train a system. And then we tested this data on, data from, on, on the world from, from March up till July. So this way our algorithm could learn if there was some kind of pattern underneath which was actually able to predict that things were going to happen. And this is what we, what we got out. So again, you need to think when you look at these. Same thing here, we have the publishing time here and we have the predicted time here. Again, this time we're actually doing it looking at three-day intervals. So for example, we can say that, see that on uh, June 16, we had sort of a low level, but still some worrying about protests from June 17 to June 19 and so on. And we recognized from the previous slide, the thing over here, as you recall, we knew very early on that there would be a lot of people planning to do protests on June 30. And we see the same pattern over here. Essentially, no one thought that anything would happen after June 30. But the interesting thing is when you go up here to June 27, 28, then you see a change in the pattern here. So our mathematical models, based on the volumes and the kind of tweets, and we actually also measured the degree of violence in texts people are writing. So based on this, our model could say that not only would there be protests on June 30, there was enough emphatic anger in Egypt so that there was a high likelihood that there would continue to be protests going forward. So we could actually say three, four days in advance that this would not be a one-day thing. There would actually be continuing protests and uprising in Egypt, which is, of course, exactly what happened. Pretty nice. And this is not the only case. So what we did was we, we looked at this for different days and we looked in different countries. And in general, what we came, the conclusion we have is by looking at what actually happened out in the world is that we can actually predict with 75% correctness whether there will be protests on a day or not compared to flipping a coin where you would, of course, only get 50% correct if you flip a coin to predict if there's going to be a protest. And this was at the country level. If you go down and do this on the city level, you get even better precision. We're up to 85% correctness in knowing two or three days in advance where there will be protests. And this is actually stunningly good results. We were, when we first looked at it, we could hardly believe it ourselves. But this actually shows that we as humans, we're pretty good as a sensor. What we think, what we write, what we talk about, if you analyze that, structure it, put it into a mathematical model, you can actually start understanding the future. I always like to end these kinds of talks with uh, my favorite prediction, Alan Kay, who back in 1968 wrote, wrote about the Dyna book. Some of you have seen this, you know. Looks pretty much like an iPad, doesn't it? So, and he had this great quote that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And what we like to think is that maybe, you know, you don't have to invent it, you can actually predict it in other ways as well. Thank you. <laughs>